Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together for our weekly Torah study session where we open up a book that has a written text before us. And then we also look up and we see faces that are also texts uh, before us. And we're able to draw wisdom uh, from each of those. And we expand the scope of the text that we call our tradition by being attentive both to what's been written and handed to us and what each of us brings uh, to this table and this discussion. Uh, this week we are in Parshat Chaye Sarah, which is in the book of Genesis, beginning with chapter 3, verse 1. What we will do is we will read through an English translation of our weekly portion. Okay. I'll start off by reading a few verses, and then I'll offer other people an opportunity to read some verses if they'd like. And then I'll share with you a focus study about this week's portion, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation about this week's portion. If you'd like to unmute at this time, if you'd like to uh, can participate in saying the blessing that gives thanks for the opportunity of studying Torah together, feel free to do so. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. And now, if you'd like to go back and mute at this time, uh, I will go ahead and read a few verses, and then I'll uh, offer others an opportunity to read as well, at which point, of course, you can unmute and read. Uh, and then we will continue until we've finished our portion. So we are in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Sarah's lifetime, the span of Sarah's life, came to 127 years. Sarah died in Kirat Arba, now Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham proceeded to mourn Sarah and to bewail her. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead and spoke to the Hittite, saying, I am a resident alien among you. Sell me a burial site among you that I may remove my dead for burial. And the Hittites replied to Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord, you are the elect of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold his burial place from you for burying your dead. Thereupon Abraham bowed low to the people of the land, the Hittites, and he said to them, If it is your wish that I remove my dead for burial, you must agree to intercede for me with Ephron, son of Zohar. Let him sell me the cave of Machpelah that he owns, which is at the edge of his land. Let him sell it to me at the full price for a burial site in your midst. Richard, would you like to read starting at verse 10? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Ephron was present among the children of Heth. So Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the children of Heth, all who sat on the council of his town, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed low before the people of the land and spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If only you would hear me out. Let me pay the price of the land. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. And Ephron replied to Abraham, saying to him, My lord, do hear me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Go, oh, bury your dead. Abraham accepted Ephron's terms. Abraham paid out to Ephron the money that he had named in the hearing of the children of Heth, 400 shekels of silver at the going merchant's rate. So Ephron's land in Nachpela facing Mamre, the field with its cave and all the trees anywhere within the confines of that field passed to Abraham as his possession in the presence of the children of Heth, all of whom sat on the council of his town. And then Abraham buried his wife, Sarah, in the cave of the field at Machpelah, facing Mamre, now Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Thus the field with its cave passed from the children of Heth 
to Abraham as a burial. Thank you. Steve, would you like to read a little bit uh, at the very start of chapter 24? Okay. Abraham was now old, advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to the senior servant of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the Lord, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to the land of my birth and get a wife for my son, Isaac. <clears throat> and the servant said to him, what if the woman does not consent to follow me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham answered him, on no account must you take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who promised me on oath, saying, I will find this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you and you will get a wife for my son from there, a for my and if the woman does not consent to follow you, you shall then be clear in the south to me, but do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore to him his bid. Thank you. Sherry, you want to continue there at verse 10? Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and set out taking with him all the bounty of his master. And he made his way to Aram, how do we pronounce Naharayim. it? Naharayim, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down by the well outside the city at ev evening time, the time when the women come out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, grant me a good fortune this day and deal graciously with my master Abraham. Here I stand by the spring as the daughters of the townsmen, of the townsmen come out to draw water. Let the maiden, maiden to whom I say, please lower your jar that I may drink. And who replies drink, and I will also water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have de had decreed for your servant Isaac. Thereby shall I know that you have dealt graciously with my master. Thank you. Kath, would you like to read starting verse 15? Yes, hello, and thank you. Okay. He had scarcely finished speaking when Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The maiden was very beautiful and a virgin, no man having known her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. The servant ran toward her and said, Please let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and she quickly lowered her jar upon her hand and let him drink. When she had let him drink his fill, she said, I will also draw for your camels until they finish drinking. Quickly emptying her jar into the trough, she ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. Thank you so much. June, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 21? Thank you, Rabbi. The man, meanwhile, stood gazing at her, silently wondering whether the Lord had made his errand successful or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring, weighing half a half shekel, and two gold bands for her arms, Ten shekels in weight. Pray tell me, he said, whose daughter are you? Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She replied, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. And she went on, There is plenty of straw and feed at home, and also room to spend the night. The man bowed low in homage to the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his steadfast faithfulness from my master. For I have been guided on my errand by the Lord 
to the house of my master's kinsman. Thank you, Jim. Uh -huh. Jim, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 28? Thank you, Rabbi. The maiden ran and told all this to her mother's household. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out to the man at the spring. When he saw the nose ring and the bands on his sister's arms, and when he heard his sister Rebecca say, thus the man spoke to me. He went up to the man who was still standing beside the camels at the spring. Come in, O blessed of the Lord. He said, why do you remain outside when I have made ready the house and a place for the camels? So the man entered the house and the camels were unloaded. The camels were given straw and feed and water was brought to bathe his feet and the feet of the men with them. But when food was set before him, he said, I will not eat until I have told my tale. He said, speak then. Thanks so much, Jim. Let me invite David and Susan, if you'd like to continue there at verse 34. Oh. Yes, thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> and he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has grown great. He has given him sheep and cattle and silver and gold and made male and female slaves and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master after she had grown old, and he has given him all that he has. And my master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanite in whose land I dwell, but to my father's house you shall go and to my clan and you shall take a wife for my son. I said to my master, what if the woman will not follow me? He answered, Adonai, before whom I have walked, will send you an angel who will clear the way for you. <clears throat> you will take a wife for my son from my clan, from my father's family. You will be free from your obligation only if you go to my relations and they refuse you. In that case, you will be free from your obligation. When I came to the well today, I prayed, Adonai, God of my master Abraham, if you truly intend to clear the way on which I am going, here I am at the water fount. When a young woman comes out to get water, I will say to her, please give me a drink of water from your pitcher. If she answers, go ahead and drink, and I will draw water for your camels too. Let her be the one you have designated as the wife for my master's son. Before I had finished rehearsing my thoughts, Rebecca, Rebecca came with a water pitcher on her shoulder and went down to the well to get water. And I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her pitcher and said, drink, and I will water your camels too. So I drank, and she gave water to the camels too. I asked her, Whose daughter are you? And she answered, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of, son of Nahor and Milcah. Then I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. I, melt, I knelt down in worship of Adonai, and I praised Adonai, the God of my master Abraham, who has led me on the right path to get the daughter of my master's brother for his son. And now, if you mean to treat my master with faithful kindness, tell me, if not, tell me, and I will turn in another direction. Thank you so much, both of you. And Rose, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 50? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Um, then Laban and, uh, oh, then Laban and Bethel answered, the matter was decreed by Hashem. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Um, I was Verse 51. I'm sorry, yes. I'm having trouble moving my screen. Um, I'm sorry, give me a second. Um, call on somebody else. I'm okay, this time. Uh, Robert, would you like to continue there at verse 51? Yes, thank you. Behold, Rebecca is before thee. Take her and go, 
and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that she will go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Thank you so much, Robert. Norm, do you want to read a little bit this evening? We're on verse 62, if you have a copy. Sure. Thank you, Rabbi. Hmm. Isaac had just come back from the vicinity of Ber Lahai Roy, for he was settled in the region of the Negev. But Isaac went out walking in the field toward evening, and looking up, he saw camels approaching. Raising his eyes, Rebekah saw Isaac. She alighted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field toward us? And the servant said, That is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Isaac then brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he took Rebekah as his wife. Isaac loved her and thus found comfort after his mother's death. Thank you so much. And Catherine, would you like to read a little bit starting at the beginning of chapter 25? Thank you, Rabbi. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Joksan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Joksan begot Sheba and Dedan. The descendants of Dedan were the Ash for him, Asherim, the Larishim, and Elomin. The descendants of Midian were Epha, Epher, Enoch, Abida, and Elda. All these were descendants of Keturah. Abraham willed all that he owned to Isaac, but to Abraham's sons by concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. This was the total span of Abraham's life, 175 years. And Abraham breathed his last, dying at a good ripe old age, old and contented, and he was gathered to his kin. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Mash Mashpelah, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field that Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried and Sarah his wife. After the death of Abraham, God ceased his son Isaac, and Isaac settled near Beer Lahai Roy. Well, thank you so much. And let me invite uh, Justin, if you'd like to read, starting with verse 12. Thank you, Rabbi. Now, these are the generations of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, the maidservant of Sarah, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their births. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebaioth, and Kedar, and Ab Adbeel, 
and Mibsam. And Mishma and Duma and Masa. Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedma. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names in their open cities and in their walled cities, twelve princes of their to their nations. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, one hundred years and thirty years and seven years, and he expired and died and was gathered to his people. And they dwelt from Havilah to Shur, which borders on Egypt, going towards Ashur, before all his brothers he dwelt. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That's our entire Torah portion for the week. I'd like to share with you a focused study about it. If you have a copy of this study sheet, I invite you to take it out at this time. And uh, what I'd like to uh, focus on a bit is... Uh, this year, as I was reading this, uh, the weekly Torah portion, um, yes, yeah, so I just made a couple of notes here by a mistake. Uh, that's okay. You can have this one, and I'll remember those notes. Uh, I was looking at this week's Torah portion. I was struck by the sequence of events that happens. And so that's what I have here. And number one on the study sheet, Sarah dies. Abraham buries her in the cave of Machpelah. Abraham seeks a wife for Isaac. Rebecca appears at the well. Isaac brings Rebecca into Sarah's tent. Abraham remarries. Abraham fathers more children. Isaac and Ishmael come together to bury Abraham. And then uh, we have this concluding section uh, that Justin has read, uh, which starts off in the Hebrew words uh, with the Hebrew phrase um, here on verse uh, 12 of 25. It uh, says, the uh, Ela Todot Ishmael. This is the line of Ishmael. And I was struck by that because if you read ahead just a little bit, you'll see that next week's Torah portion begins, the Ela Todot Yitzhak. So there's this lovely balance here with this week's uh, Torah portion concluding with a recitation of the line of Ishmael. And next week's portion is going to begin with the very same phrase that describes the line of Isaac. So as I was looking at this sequence of events, I was struck by how Sarah's death, uh, which is described in the first couple of verses, uh, of our weekly Torah portion uh, is immediately, if you will, uh, taken over by this whole other series of events, all of which have to do with moving forward into life. That is, Abraham immediately after burying his wife, the first thing he does is, I need to get a wife for my son. And then, of course, we have the encounter between Abraham's servant and the woman who becomes Isaac's wife, Rebecca. And uh, Rebecca joins Isaac within uh, the tent of Isaac's mother, Sarah, and he finds comfort there. And then what happens immediately after that is Abraham takes a new wife and Abraham has more children. And then the two uh, sons of Abraham, that had become split apart, Ishmael and, and Isaac are reunited in order to carry out the, the obligation of burying their father. And then we conclude, as I said, with a recitation of the line of Ishmael, the one who was uh, apparently excluded, we thought, from the story, but he's brought back into the story at the end of this week's Torah portion. What I thought about looking at this sequence of events is that the focus of this week's portion is not so much on the death of Sarah, the, the, the first great matriarch, and its impact on uh, Abraham personally and on the whole storyline, but rather it's on the life, her life, 
and its impacts uh, on, on the entire storyline. So uh, this points out to me a, a theme that I see again and again in Torah, which is that uh, the focus is on this world. It is on the responsibilities, the activities that we engage in in this world to make this world meaningful rather than to be drawn down into a dark abyss that, that is what we, we call death. So Torah is all about our responsibilities and our possibilities. In a sense, its message is we should not accept uh, the limitations that we see before us. We should not accept stasis, that is that things will always remain the same and that we should not accept that what is now, it will always be. It encourages us uh, to imagine things being different and thus uh, to continue to be in dynamic force in this world rather than to stop and despair. When I thought about a, a work of art that might be able to get us into a, a different way of looking at this week's Torah portion, a portal into what I'm seeing in this week's Torah portion in words, I turn to the Impressionists generally, because the Impressionists were a revolutionary art movement uh, that overturned the orientation of art as it existed for hundreds of years. Uh, they rejected what was then called the, the classical view of what is reality and how to, how to uh, describe visually through painting that reality and the notion that there was really only one acceptable sense of, of what is reality. And so the Impressionists come along and they reject all that, both in terms of uh, how they paint and what they painted. And more importantly, perhaps they reject it by what they understood to be the role of the artist. So they understood the role of the artist not to try and replicate reality in some kind of singular objective sense. They thought the role of the artist was to bring one's subjectivity uh, of one's subjective encounter uh, mm -hmm. to the canvas and to share that uh, uh, with others in the hopes that others would then see that and would inspire either other artists or viewers themselves to feel liberated to share their subjective encounters uh, of what reality is. And so one of those uh, great artists who joined them in the early days was actually an American, an American artist, uh, a woman, Mary Cassatt. And Mary Cassatt was born in about 1844. And when she was 21, she uh, left Pennsylvania and her home and her parents and went to France and she studied with a number of artists. Uh, she tried to get exhibited in what was then the formally accepted uh, exhibition known as the Salon, which was a, a highly vetted by the high French authorities. And uh, she was, her works were rejected. And that those rejections inspired her to turn away from, if you will, the approved forms of art, the conventions of art, and to embrace uh, the unconventional uh, styles and subjects of art as they were being practiced by the Impressionists. And she ended up exhibiting at four of the eight independently mounted exhibitions that the Impressionists uh, did. She was particularly close with Degas, who was one of her one of her great teachers, and she was also very close uh, on a number of levels with uh, Monet and Edwin Pizarro as well. And so here is uh, one of her works. Uh, although the Impressionists were revolutionary in many ways, uh, not only be how they painted and what they painted, but also the fact that they embraced women uh, within within their group, women. Uh, up until the Impressionists had a very hard time becoming professional painters because they were excluded from the formal academies where they could study. They were excluded from most of the approved studios where they, where they could study. And so the Impressionists provided uh, women with a framework within which uh, they could paint and study and, and learn with others and, and exhibit as well. However, 
uh, they were still subject to a lot of the uh, dominant uh, culture of uh, France at the time, which made it difficult for women just to go out of the house on their own, set up an easel um, in, in some location and, and paint. And so this was discouraged. And so a lot of what Mary Cassatt painted were domestic scenes, the life of women, children, life within the home, and also trying to capture, if you will, the interior life uh, of women as well. So here is her painting, Young Girl at a Window. So before I go too much further in the study sheet, I just want to open it up to uh, invite you to say, what do you see uh, in this painting? Uh, both what do you see with your eyes and what do you see with your heart in, in this painting? If you want to go ahead, David, go ahead and uh, unmute and share with us. The very first thing that I saw when I pulled up the painting and blew it up so that it was a little better than what my printer does is it very clearly to me, subjectively, I see tears in her eyes that mm -hmm. also look a little puffy and maybe even a track of a tear going down her cheek. Mm -hmm. That's and that combined with what you have outlined about her history, um, I don't know what the connection is, but she started art school in Philadelphia. First of all, she's born in Alec uh, Allegheny, yep. which was a little bit of a frontier town. And then she went to art school in Philadelphia, starting right before the gunfire of the Civil War and leaving right at the right at the end, the most terrible um, episode in, in American history. I don't know how they're compared to the tears, but this very, very pretty young woman is very, for me, very sad, taking a lot of comfort out of her lap dog. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For, and thank you for bringing in the dog. But uh, let me invite uh, Robert. Would you like to share something? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for another lovely evening. You know, this... Uh, this painting, as well as this, as what we read tonight, both are replete with story. What I immediately saw in this was an indictment of our times. She has all the material things of life. She even has a pet. She has exquisite clothing. She has a beautiful view overlooking water, but she's forlorn and sad. And I think in our world today, there is so much focus in the Western world on material things instead of the spirit. And I think this is just, just very clear that no matter what we have materially does not bring joy and happiness. Nothing wrong with material goods and enjoying the things of life, but she's forlorn and sad. She's captive within her own dress, her own environment. Mm. Wow. Thank you. So thank you, Rara. And Justin? Wow. Okay. Um... You know, I'm just kind of with the painting itself. I'm just kind of thinking about the way that the the I want to do a gesture because it feels like the 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 colors and the way that the 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 application is is doing this back and forth as I'm moving into and out of different parts of it that pull me in or or let me go. And I really appreciate the emotional like comments that have been made about this the, this, but I'm just kind of. I mean, the overall feeling is, I mean, again, the colors are so warm in it. I mean, so it's just like, I mean, and, and, and earthy. And so there, there, there could be sadness or other greater ideological things, but I think just kind of feeling the, the way that the whites are shimmering, the leaves of the tree are shimmering also, and the dog's coat is shimmering. Okay. That's it. That's lovely. I love the shimmering. Okay. Let me invite uh, Catherine. Yes, uh, I'd like to follow up on Justin's impression. Um, what I first thought of and what really resonates with our Pashat is this idea of caretaking. Mm. Gesture of caretaking in the way that she's holding the dog. And so I thought of Rebecca with her jug of water and sort of this idea of caretaking that um, it's not only good 
you know, it, it, for Isaac, but it, it will be good for the community. So I don't know. That was my my take on it. That's fabulous. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, let me invite Rose and, and then others in this room here may want to say something. Rose, go ahead. Well, uh, a couple of things. When I look at the picture, I also think of the other impressionist picture that uh, you um, had uh, you chose to accompany another one of our Dvarim, uh, the one by Renoir, the um, barmaid, kind of looking mm. very pensive. Um, this young woman, instead of just looking at us, she's really in her own thoughts. I'm not sure how sad she is, but I think she's very absorbed in her own thoughts. And she kind of invites you to try to figure out what she's thinking. Um, you know, and the, that's kind of analogous to yet another painting, the Mona Lisa, where you have the same background. That same, and I don't know if Cassatt really chose that kind of very um, just suggestive background. You don't really see, you know, towers or anything or trees or anything, but there's a background there. And But instead of Mona Lisa, it looks like she's got it. You know, she's she's at the top of the game. She's smirking at you. This young woman is different. And I like what, was it Margo who said something about caretaking? Because I think Marie Cassatt never married. She never had children. Right. And so this young woman taking care of the dog may be in a way autobiographical, because, mm -hmm. you know, kind of reflecting this disappointment in not having children of her own. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Yes. Uh, this conversation is interesting to me because it reminds me of what we were talking about when, when Abraham left home and God told him, go inside yourself. And this lady, this young woman, is not looking out this window. She's not enjoying the comforts of materialism. She's dwelling on something. And the, the idea of her taking care of the dog, what occurred to me is that now, at this point in history, at our time, we're all beset with all the slaughter that's going on in the world. And we're trying to bring in and grieve over it, but also be able to extract some love and understanding out of it somehow and have a little dog to pet and try to change our attitude in this new existential situation. That's what came to mind through this conversation for me. Thank you, Richard. And Kat? Yeah. I was affected by many things with this. Um, my feeling with her was, Almost she looks like she's in shock. There's a stillness about her. And I'm also noticing if she's wearing basically what appears to be white. So mm -hmm. that's interesting because lots of times it seems like there's a lot more color going on. And white is often significant depending on the culture and the what year, you know, where it is in the history. Um I was also thinking that. It may be that the dog is caretaking her oh. instead of her caretaking the dog, like the dog just being there is such a comfort for her. And then artistically, I was blown away with the detail of the city across mm -hmm. the river. It's it's so simple, but it just can't, felt very detailed to me with something being so far away. Uh -huh. I just thought that was was stunning. And the the open, she's out, it feels to me she's outside, she's on a um, a balcony okay. above, and that not necessarily jail, but that the, the railing, the, the balcony, you know, the gate on the, the railing, railing is very open, uh -huh. which is sort of a flow in and out of energy. Right. But she just seems so still. That's just that stillness of grief where you're just not moving. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Steve, did you want to share? Oh, I just wanted to say that 
the depth, the three dimensionality of it. It looks mm -hmm. really like it's you're there in three D. Wow. I, so so I, I go ahead. Do you want to say some more about that? No, I mean that's yeah. what really. I mean, I feel like I'm right, right. She's right in front of me, and the, the city's there. So uh, I want to just uh, continue on with that notion just a little bit because I think it speaks to what a lot of people have have raised, which is that sense of dimension dimensionality that that you just talked about, which is you have this dog in her lap, her hand is on the dog. So that draws us to that, that being, that bit of life that's there. And then uh, I think it was David who, who really focused on her expression and he saw tears there. And uh, Richard talked about how perhaps like Abraham, she is focused on something internal about herself rather than she has this beautiful view to look out on as, you, as you've all noticed. But she's not looking out at that. Uh, she's she seems to be focused on something interior, either interior to that physical space or in, interior to her, her, herself as well. And uh, Kath mentions the the railing that's there, but at the window, the railing which then creates that bit of framing to make clear that there is indeed a separation between where she is and what's beyond where she is. Uh, and then that in a sense, it, it, it focuses our attention uh, to both by giving that bit of, uh, of a border. We focus on what's right before the railing and then the railing allows us to then see as a separate dimension what's beyond the railing. And uh, we have, yes, the water, I think as Robert mentioned that, mm -hmm. and, and then the, the city, the civilization that's beyond it. And so it's a wonderful question to, to, to wonder how much of all of those dimensions she is aware of, she's focusing on, but clearly the artist, Cassatt herself, is aware of all those dimensions. Otherwise she would not have presented all of them to us the dog, the woman, the room, the railing, the water, the, the civilization. And it's it's wonderful to consider whether Kas Kasat, Mary Cassatt herself is making some kind of a statement about uh, how important this intimate relationship is, woman, dog, the, the woman's interior life, and then saying something about the, the a dimension that's beyond the railing. Is that something, is Kassat saying something about how that could be her dimension as well? Or is she saying that's not as worthwhile? So just to bring back a bit of Kassat's biography, we want to acknowledge that uh, when the, the Jewish uh, French officer, Alfred Dreyfus was uh, tried for, for treason, it, it caused an eruption of anti-Semitism within France and caused an eruption within the Impressionist movement as well. Some of whom uh, revealed themselves in their anti-Semitism and some of whom uh, became strong advocates uh, for Dreyfus. And among the strongest advocates for Dreyfus uh, were uh, Monet, Camille Pizarro, and Mary Cassatt. And it must have been hard for her that one of those who was most virulent in his anti-Semitism was her teacher, uh, Degas. So that's one aspect of it. And then when uh, Mary Cassatt returns to the United States, she becomes very much involved in the women's suffrage movement. And she uh, uh, sells her paintings and raises monies for the, for, for the women's suffrage movement. So clearly these are causes that uh, she devoted herself to that extended beyond the interior life that she painted of uh, women, children uh, within homes. So it's a wonderful thing to consider how much of the, what's in this painting in particular is a statement about the reality of the moment and the possibilities of, of what could come next. And, and with that, I'd like to invite you to turn over uh, the study sheet uh, so I can share with you a, a couple of more uh, thoughts to add to our discussion. 
One of the things that struck me when, as I was reading this uh, week's Torah portion is that we see Isaac, it says Isaac has just come back from the vicinity of Ber Lachai Roy, which is, uh, and when he does that, he that's where he comes back from there. He meets Rebecca, uh, he takes Rebecca into Sarah's tent. And then immediately after that, what happens is that uh, Abraham marries again. And so we have a lot of lovely, intriguing commentary that says, basically, ah, Ber Lachai Roy, I remember that place. And what uh, the commentaries remember is that that's where Hagar went. Mm -hmm. Hagar called a particular place that she ran to when uh, she felt that Sarah was treating her so badly and that she couldn't take it anymore. So she ran away and she runs to this place. And in this place, she hears a, the divine voice saying, why, why are you running away? Go back, go back. And everything is going to work out. And she, it says Hagar calls that place Ber Lachai Roy, which one can translate as the well of the living one who sees me. So she names it that place because she's had this encounter with a presence who revives her, who, re who encourages her to return from a point of despair back into a reality where she gives birth to her child. Uh, and that child, uh, Ishmael, becomes the head of a, a great nation. So here is Isaac coming back, it says in our weekly Torah portion, from a place called Ber Lachai Roy, and the commentator said, Why, what was he doing there? And the commentators uh, have this lovely midrash, this lovely notion that says, ah, he went there to get Hagar to bring her back to marry Abraham. And that this person that Abraham marries, according to this lovely midrash, is Hagar, the woman that he had fathered a child with. And now after all these years, they're reunited and uh, she gives birth to all these other children uh, in, in Abraham's old age. So if you will, this notion about uh, Ber Lachai Roy, the well, the living one who sees me, this becomes a phrase that connotes a sense of revival and new possibilities. The encounter with this presence becomes that which enables us to move beyond our despair, our loneliness, our sense of having no further worth in this world. And so this is what brings us out of uh, this moment and returns us into new, new possibilities. So with that, let me share with you uh, a rather extended bit of quote from a work by Rabbi Yaakov Lehner. Rabbi Yaakov Lehner was the son of one of the great Hasidic, Hasidic rabbis. We actually have read some of his work before. He's the son of Rabbi Mordechai Yosef Lehner, who was the founder of one of the great Hasidic dynasties known as the Ishbitzer uh, Hasidic dynasty. Uh, and he was the author of the a book called the Mehachi Loach, which we have introduced in our commentaries before. So Rabbi Yaakov Lehner is his son, and his uh, works are eventually published by his son in a book called Beit, ya Beit Yaakov. And this is a quote from a book about his work by a wonderful uh, scholar, Ora Wiskin Elper. She wrote a book called Wisdom of the Heart. So what I'm going to read to you in, in the bracket there is just a little bit of an introduction she wrote, and then we'll read uh, Rabbi Lehner's works, words as well. And Ora Wiskin Elper, as a way of introducing us to uh, a text of Rabbi Lehner, writes, Doubt casts its heavy cloud over just about every aspect of human existence. At certain junctures, the path leading to the next moment seems totally obscured. And now the words of Rabbi Yaakov Lehner. Death speaks of absence. The dead themselves harbor no more hope of being alive because they feel hopeless and utterly despairing. In that subjective sense, they are dead. Death means a degradation to a lower state. 
as the Zohar says, the dead are humbled. That is, one cannot comprehend the hope of returning to live again. Truly, though, the breath of the bones never dies. All those days when it looked as if one was dead and gone, so in the future, when the dead live again, all of them will know themselves. They will recall all the experiences of their lives and the days they rested, died. Now they will see that it is they themselves who have risen to live again. In this radical notion here, Rabbi Lehner is now no longer talking about death as a biological phenomenon. He's talking about it as a psychological phenomenon. And when he talks about breath of the bones, that's a reference to a vision that the prophet Ezekiel has mm -hmm. uh, of uh, can these bones live again? And so now Rabbi Lehner is saying that vision that Ezekiel has is not about bodily resurrection. It's about psychological revival and the ability to uh, draw ourselves out of these moments of, of despair and, and frustration. And uh, so this is uh, Rabbi Lehner is sharing with us this, I think, notion that we're going to see again and again in Torah, uh, which is what our Torah is really designing uh, us to do is training us uh, to encounter what are inevitable frustrations in our lives. Uh, the inevitable uh, temptation to just sink into an abyss of despair. And Torah is warning us that's going to happen, but you have the capacity to revive yourself. You have the capacity to be in touch, if you will, with the well of the living one who sees me uh, and, and to return back into the possibilities of life. And Tor is constantly trying to imagine, uh, is trying to encourage us to imagine life otherwise than it is right now. And we'll see that played out both, if you will, on an ethical level, a historical level, a political level. And here as the Hasidic tradition is constantly trying to remind us, it's also constantly true on the psychological level as well, to imagine life otherwise with that i'd love to see it are there other thoughts uh that people have about this week's torah portion things that you experienced or, or saw in this week's portion uh david and susan you have your hand raised <clears throat> so i loved your midrash about hagar and abraham but i had i had formed this comment before that and that is that i thought that the last time that we had seen Ishmael was uh, when Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away. And <clears throat> excuse me. And then the next time we see Ishmael, it's when he's burying his father. So that he has whatever animus that there may have been from he and his mom being sent away. He, I don't, we don't know, we're free to, to, to think about but we don't know anything that happened in between. And now he's he's paying the respect to his father, regardless of anything that had happened. I just was touched by that. And, and you got me to looking back in our portion. And in verse 17, uh, it says, uh, uh, the Yishmael. So, uh, this phrase, Chaye uh, Sarah, is going to be echoed in one of the final verses of the portion, and it's about Ishmael. So all these members of the family, uh, both with uh, Hagar and Isaac, with a reference to Berachai of the Roy, Sarah and Ishmael, the sense of hope that's being portrayed here. Uh, that what was torn apart uh, can be rewoven back together. Uh, so l let me invite Robert and then Rose. Thank you. Actually, I think Rose was first, though. So. Okay, go ahead, Rose. Go ahead. Thank you, Robert. Go ahead. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, what you just said, I think quite literally when it says, Kaye Sora. 
you know, we use the word chayim to mean as the plural is life, but it could also mean the lives that came from Sarah. Mm -hmm. You know, that the life that came from Sarah, in other words, not just the physical lives, but the chain of events that came from Sarah. And then it just says also, Chaye Ishmael, you know, that actually his descendants are named so that each of us, even though we may die, we continue, you know, to live on. And I did want to comment that I think this Parsha bringing Yitzchak and Ishmael together is very poignant considering current events. Because thank you. Here, here we are. Here we are. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for bringing that up. Let me invite Robert now. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Lovely evening. Thank you again. And I think if any night we've had story in in the in uh, art and in the Torah, boy, tonight for me is the night because that that picture has so much more in it. But I love the story. And as I actually read this before we we gathered, and uh, a few things just really struck me about uh, Abraham and his servant and Rebecca. The trust uh, that Abraham has in God is a given, but he also has trust in his servant. So mm. the faithfulness of the servant. Now the servant has faith in Abraham and God's will. And then the servant has praise that Rebecca has uh, agreed to, to marry Isaac and go with him. So now we have the confluence of trust, faith, and praise, which I think are just beautiful attributes to mingle together. And then later on, or, or earlier on, we saw generosity and justice, which again are just a, a beautiful confluence where the one says, no, take the land. So now we've learned, we've learned generosity. But then Abraham says, no, I must pay you. And to me, that shows the importance of justice over generosity, mm. because civilization cannot endure without that. And then, of course, we had the hospitality, obedience, fortitude. But well, I just love this story. It's nice to be with you all again, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and let me call. Thank you, Robert. Beautiful. Let me call upon uh, Steve and then June. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> the Alpha Dreyfus case the most out, outspoken uh, defender of Dreyfus uh, was Emile Zola, yeah. Yeah. And Jacques. Uh, yeah. And, and just a little I, bit. I, in all of the French literature and history I've read, I never knew that uh, America Scott was uh, yeah. a... Uh, had, had some and, influence. And, and actually, before yeah. writing Jacques, uh, Emile Zola was a uh, was a promoter of the Impressionists. He he, he wrote uh, art reviews uh, about their oh, work okay. as well. Yeah, l l go ahead, June. Two questions. Number one, when Abraham remarried, it didn't say he remarried Hagar. It was a different name. Is that right. her other name? Yes, uh, we have uh, many characters having different names, and so. Uh, here in the text, it says Keturah, which connotes something about incense, perhaps. That's a, uh, and it's just a matter of the commentators connecting Isaac's uh, coming from a place called Ber HaLeroy. And they say, why did he go there? And they say, oh, that's because that's where Hagar was. And that's who this woman really is. So uh, it's just a, it's a lovely, lovely, sweet thing. So let me... Um, let me just thank everyone uh, for a very rich conversation and to say that uh, you know these these notions about being able to draw ourselves out of these moments of frustration and even despair and depression uh it is it is hard to do uh, on one's own uh and the notion about being able to experience if you will what's called uh, the well of living one who sees me, I think, is enhanced so much more 
our Jewish practice tells us when we do it within community, when we're in relationships with others. And so I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for helping to create uh, and strengthen my own capacity uh, to imagine life being otherwise. God bless you all. I look forward to our next gathering. Be well, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.